This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices. Hello and welcome to this Digital Money Talks, Currency with Consequences, Circulating Counterfeits in the United States. My name is Jesse Kraft, Assistant Curator of American Numismatics at the American Numismatic Society. As many of you know, these Money Talks are generally held in person at our conference room at 75 Barrick Street, New York City, but due to the COVID-19 lockdown, we've switched to this digital format, which has proven itself immensely popular, especially by our members who live nowhere near the city. The circulation of counterfeit coinage is a vast field with many, many examples. That said, this Money Talks is not intended to provide an in-depth study, a complete history of the topic, or present groundbreaking research. This has been the topic of entire books, and we could sit here for days talking about counterfeit coins and never repeat ourselves. Rather, my goal is to provide each of you with a general overview of certain issues, how they were made, how people tried to avoid receiving them in change, and consequences that counterfeiters faced when caught. Most importantly, I just want each of you to enjoy yourselves on the Saturday afternoon despite the fact that we aren't together drinking wine like we would at a traditional money talks. Throughout the course of this presentation, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat area by clicking the button that is located at the bottom of the screen, and we will discuss them in the order that they appear at the conclusion of this presentation. So what is a circulating or a contemporary counterfeit coin? In short, these are non-genuine coins that individuals create it for the sake of spending. While some of them do, they were not originally intended to defraud collectors. But to get past the store clerk or anyone who else would receive money in the course of general commerce. Many older specimens are collectible, especially those from the 19th century and before. In the United States, individuals have counterfeited bills and coins in denomination of half cent and much higher. This phenomenon, however, did not begin in the United States and is basically as old as money itself. There are many types of non-genuine coins, however, so what isn't a contemporary counterfeit? None of these four coins are completely genuine, while none are contemporary either. The first coin was created by an individual named Smith in the 1850s or 60s. He took genuine coins and re-graved them to bring up details and then resold them. Today, while nowhere near as valuable as an unadulterated coin, these are still collectible since they are at one time genuine mint products, albeit altered to a large degree. The ANS has nine different examples and none are very deceptive. The second coin is an electrotype. This was also created with the use of a genuine coin whose details were transferred to a thin copper plate through the electrolysis process, one half coin at a time, uh, then usually joined together and filled with lead. These were highly popular in the 19th century as a means to fill a hole in one's collection at a fraction of the price. And this is still the case today, as these are popular but cheap alternatives to buying a genuine 1793 chain cent. The third coin is a modern day copy and is marked as such on the reverse side. It is the product of the Gallery Mint Museum, which made many similar replicas for different rare coins. The fourth coin, however, is a counterfeit and to deceive a coin collector. It was likely made within the last generation or two and could have cost someone a lot of money. How are contemporary counterfeits made? There are two general methods struck by a die or cast in a mold. Like the name implies, die struck counterfeits used a set of dies. Of these, there are two different means of creating a set. One is to engrave a design that resembles a genuine coin as closely as possible, though the results to those who know coin designs intimately are often humorous. And we'll see some examples in a bit. 
Another method is to create a set of transfer dies, like an electrotype coin. This second method utilizes the electrolysis process to transfer the design of a coin to the face of a, of a die. This counterfeit die to the right was hand engraved by a well-trained hand and used to strike Spanish mill dollars in the late 18th century. It is thought to have been created in New York City as its construction resembles other counterfeit dies from that location. Second method is to cast molten metal into a mold that contains the design of a coin. Unlike hand engraved dies, the design of the coin is transferred on a one-to-one -one basis. However, the results are often uh, quite mushy. The surfaces of the coin are much more granular and the coin itself doesn't have the same feel as a die struck coin. After being struck by a set of dies, a coin is under physical pressure and produces a ringing sound when tapped against something or flicked in the air. Cast coins, on the other hand, do not. Furthermore, cast coins often seem to have a seam that goes completely around the coin, uh, which the counterfeit gener counterfeiter generally tries to remove, but leaves behind file marks or other evidence behind. Here are, is an example of a cast counterfeit on the left and a die struck counterfeit from hand engraved dies on the right. The cast counterfeit has an outline of the design that closely resembles a genuine coin, but you can see that the granularity and detail is lacking. What looks like a clip on the top of the obverse are file marks made by a counterfeiter in an attempt to get rid of the sprue or extra metal left behind from the casting process. The coin on the right does not have the granularity, but certain elements just don't seem right to an experienced collector. Most notably, Liberty's head and the date. As you can see, people began counterfeiting American coinage pretty much from the time that they were first struck. The four coins on the right are contemporary counterfeits, Massachusetts silver coins produced in the second half of the 17th century. The coin on the left is genuine for comparison. Of the four counterfeits, the two on the left were intended to pass at sixpence and are of the oak tree type. Of those two, the piece on the right, the Noe 18, is a well-known variety with backwards two in the 1652 date. More than likely, this coin was identified as a counterfeit when it circulated and someone scratched X's across both sides of the coin, possibly to warn others who came across it. The third counterfeit is a pine tree shelling, the same type as the genuine coin to the left. Someone may have also identified this as a counterfeit when it circulated and identified it as such by disfiguring it with small punches on both sides. Counterfeit to the right is unlike the other three. First three are all die struck while the fourth is a cast counterfeit. Interestingly, the counterfeiter who cast the coin chose a coin that was heavily clipped, which is a popular means of taking a value from a coin before passing it off again. And is, and is the reason why so much is so much smaller than the other shilling. Throughout the late 18th century, the most available copper coin for small change were British half pennies. As a result, these coins were heavily counterfeited throughout the colonies. Some have estimated that as many as two thirds of copper coins that circulated during the period were in fact counterfeits. The top left piece is a genuine coin, but the rest are imitations. The coin on the bottom left is dated 1777, but portrays George II, who died 17 years earlier. This may have been an error or as a means to try and evade counterfeiting laws since that coin didn't technically exist in reality. The middle set of coins are struck at Matchin's Mill, operated near Newburgh, New York, about 60 miles north of New York City. This mint struck with genuine coins for Vermont under contract, as well as counterfeit coins of other states and these imitation British Afghans. These are extremely popular to collect today, and one should expect to pay multiples over a genuine British halfpenny, even in well-worn condition. Matchin's Mill, however, was not the only enterprise to counterfeit these coins, and the two examples on the right show the work of other individuals. The top right coin is somewhat crude in nature, while the coin below is rather well executed. All of these are die struck. 19th century seemed to be an apex of counterfeiting coins in the United States and offers a host of examples for present day collectors. One could build a typeset of 19th century pieces using only contemporary counterfeit coins. The top left coin is, date, is a favorite of mine, dated 1833, or portrays 
the seat at Liberty design, which was not used for, on the half dollar for another six years. Interestingly, the obverse die is hand engraved while the reverse is a transfer die. The coin below is also a counterfeit the same date, but utilizes the correct design. The large scent to its right was from hand engraved dies with humorous results. The nickel above was widely counterfeited. Introduced in 1866, the nickel was the highest denomination that was not made from precious metals, therefore offer the highest rate of return for a counterfeiter while still not using or while still using the actual composition of the genuine coin. I added the dime to the right to show that mint errors could still happen on counterfeit coins, this one being double struck. Lastly, a gold plated platinum coin. Uh, to, pre to present day observers, this doesn't make much sense considering the fact that platinum is more expensive than gold, but in the 19th century, this was not the case. This was used by counterfeiters because the two metals have a similar specific gravity, which made these coins weigh nearly the same as a genuine piece. This coin, however, was discovered and the gold from the left half was dissolved to reveal its platinum core. Counterfeiting of coins began to wane in the 20th century as their purchasing power declined, but this did not end the practice altogether. The buffalo nickel produced from transfer dyes is somewhat deceptive, while the half dollar below was made of lead and easy damaged. According to Secret Service correspondence, the quarter dollar pictured in the center was the most counterfeited coin period during, uh, during this period. The dime to the upper right was cast in lead and not particularly deceptive. The brass half eagle to the lower right is a rarity. Unlike nickels and dimes, genuine gold coins were encountered with much less frequently and would undergo greater scrutiny when received in change, which led to a lower amount of counterfeit coins. Remember, one of the primary goals of the counterfeit was to not get caught. Of course, coins were not the only pieces that were counterfeited, though paper currency offered a completely different set of challengers for a counterfeiter. These bills, both genuine, show the earliest attempts of anti-counterfeiting measure in the colonies. Invented by Benjamin Franklin in 1739, he created these leaf designs by making lead casts of actual leaves. The intricacy of the design was able to thwart many unskilled counterfeiters. The note well, on the left was printed by Franklin, while that on the right by Isaac Collins, which shows that this method worked to some degree and accepted by other printers of genuine currencies. However, not even these were immune to counterfeiting as proven by this counterfeit $6 bill from Maryland to the left. The piece to the right is in the INS collection and is a copper plate used to print counterfeit 42 shilling notes of 1775 from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Like coins, the 19th century proved a high point in the counterfeiting activities for the paper currency as well. This was especially true prior to the Civil War, known as the free banking period, when essentially anyone could open a bank and issue currency. With so many different types of notes in circulation, it was very difficult for most people to ascertain what was genuine and what was not genuine. Even once the United States government began to print counterfeit currency, counterfeiting, of course, did not end. Picture to the right are a genuine $100 bill above and a counterfeit note below. Counterfeit detection. Throughout the 18th century, traditional money scales offered one of the most reliable means of testing for counterfeits by weight. The four scales pictured to the left are typical of 18th century money scales, which came in wooden boxes that had exchange charts printed on the paper affixed to the lid, as well as an array of weights. Money weights generally came in either multiples of penny weights and grains, or as representations of coins themselves. For instance, the round weights that are pictured with the money scale to the left are representative of Spanish American four and eight reales coins. The two photos to the right are from experiments that are performed on 18th century money scales and weights as a student in the Eric P. Newman graduate seminar with the ANS in 2017. I found that money scales are not terribly accurate, especially when using such small increments as grains. Furthermore, I found that money weights were even less accurate and were often copies of copies of copies. 
each drifting further and further away from their intended mass. In the Americas, most money scales and weights were mass produced. As such, they were far less accurate than German made scales of the same period. The 19th century saw some interesting innovations for money scales. Instead of traditional beam scales, lever type designs were employed. The Fairbanks infallible scales to the left had slots in the right side of the scale to insert coins. These slots also allowed an individual to check for the proper thickness of a coin. Once inserted, if the beam came even close to even, the coin was probably, but not definitively, okay. The two scales on the right are both the invention of Harry Man Marinville of Akron, Ohio, and also used a lever style design. None of these scales were accurate and probably even less accurate than the traditional money scales of the previous century. The scale in the middle, for instance, required that the quote, the coin be tested, the coin to be tested should be moistened with spittle to cause it to adhere to the end of the box as a change in position of the coin would cause great inaccuracy in weight, end quote. In other words, whoever used the scale had to spit on their coin for the scale to even work, to work even somewhat accurately. That, by the way, was a direct quote from the inventor of the scale, Harry Robinson of Schuylkillhaven, Pennsylvania. Counterfeit detectors for paper currency also began in the 18th century. These two examples were created specifically for that. The paper that they were printed on were different than genuine pieces. These being uh, these two having hues of pink and blue, respectively. As seen on the example to the left, notes about their intended use were also sometimes added. This one read it to detect counterfeits. These are also extremely rare today. Counterfeit detectors in the 19th century grew far more complex. Many different agencies and companies created booklets specifically for this. The two images on the left are from a well-known manual created by the government for this purpose. The center image shows how detailed and visual the information could get. These manuals can even help present day collectors discern whether their notes are genuine or contemporary counterfeits. They are very interesting to read. The fractional currency shield to the right were products that were sent to banks for the purpose of comparing suspect notes to genuine pieces. Being highly ornate and works of art in their own right, these are also quite collectible today and rare. Counterfeiting, however, continued. In 1938, the Secret Service launched its quote-unquote Know Your Money campaign. This included the annual publication of pamphlets on how to detect counterfeit money and what to do if you suspect, suspect that you have some. A series of short films were also created. Today, the complete collection of these films can be purchased on DVD, 50 shorts in total on five discs, and are rather interesting to view. Campaign also included Secret Service agents giving lectures in schools throughout the country. Program lasted until at least the late 1960s, so some of you in attendance today may have sat through some of these presentations. Today, there are highly technical devices uh, used to detect counterfeit currency, from blacklight scanners to sp special ink pens that detect starch on counterfeit paper, and even a combination of the two. The pens only work on currency 1963 and newer, while the blacklight technology only works on bills from 1990 and newer. In one case, only last year, a 13-year-old girl was arrested for trying to spend a series 1953 $2 bill that did not meet the scruples of the modern day counterfeiting technology. She was later released, albeit without an apology. Getting caught. Since the beginning of counterfeiting in the Americas, counterfeiters have been getting caught. The first document reveals, reveals that James Ward was convicted of passing bad money with the intent to unjustly and injuriously deceive and defraud by counterfeiting three pound note in, 1850, in 1758. Second document receive, reveals that Henry E. Sears, quote unquote, uttered and passed two counterfeit notes of 20 shillings from North Carolina. 
For this, he was named, quote, a person of evil name and fame and dishonest conversation, end quote. In both cases, their counterfeit notes were affixed to the damning documents. I've mentioned the Secret Service a few times already, but this federal agency was founded in 1865 to thwart the widespread problems of counterfeiting. Until 2003, they were part of the Department of Treasury, even while tasked with protecting the president, which began after the 1901 assassination of President McKinley. Along with the annual uh, Secretary of the Treasury reports, the Secret Service chronicled their yearly activities as shown here from the 1876 report. As you can see, the Secret Service caught 223 counterfeiters in the previous year for an array of charges, from manufacturing counterfeit money, to possessing it, to embezzlement, and even bribery. The, charge on, the chart on the right tells of an additional 141 counterfeiters that local authorities caught before turning them over to the Secret Service. Another page from the same annual report lists the objects seized by the Secret Service. On the left are things related to paper currency and the right counterfeit coins. They seized anything from steel and copper plates for currency and steel dies for coins, as well as the casting mold made of steel, copper, wood, and plaster. Entire presses were also sometimes seized. More than a century and a half of these reports are available and are true testimony to the extent of counterfeiting operations in the country. Sometimes the stories of counterfeiters were so amazing that they themselves became famous or infamous anyhow. Jacob Ott was a German born lithographer who counterfeited $50 notes of several different banks located throughout New York. Henry C. Cole counterfeited mainly $20 notes and had $60,000 in counterfeit notes on him when he was captured in 1871. Charles Ulrich was actually the lead of a counterfeiting rings that at times included Cole. These images are from a book that sensa sensationalized these individuals in detail, um, ironically written by John Dye, the author of Dye's Government Counterfeit Detector, described earlier. Perhaps the most well-known counterfeit coin is a mid-century Jefferson nickel. These were produced by Francis Leroy Henning of Erial, New Jersey in 1954. He produced about 500,000 of these counterfeits, about 20% of which entered circulation. He struck five different dates, 1939, 44, 46, 47, 53. However, it was the 1944 dated coin that led to his downfall. From mid-1942 to 45, the U.S. Mint struck Jefferson Nichols out of a modified composition and placed a large mint mark above the Monticello building to easily detect these from uh, the regularly composed issues. Henning, however, did not take this into account, and sharp-eyed numismatists from the Camden County Coin Collectors Club first discovered this and alerted authorities in 1955. Knowing that authorities were on his lead, Henning dumped over 100,000 of these counterfeit nickels into the Cooper River. Authorities, however, were only able to uh, recover about 14,000. Interestingly, these counterfeit pieces were sent to the Philadelphia Mint to use as metal for some genuine 1956 Gen Jefferson nickels. People still sometimes prefer amateur underwater archaeology to try and recover these highly collectible collectible counterfeit coins. Henning was convicted of, his counter, of counterfeiting $1 bills prior to this nickel venture. Emmerich Utner, who counterfeited $1 bills from 1938 to 1948 in Manhattan. He was the longest known counterfeiter to evade the Secret Service. His story is somewhat sad in that he turned to counterfeiting after his wife had passed away and felt like he had no other means of earning money. As such, he only spent enough to survive just 10 to $12 a week. He evaded getting caught for so long because he rarely spent bills at the same place twice and few individuals were checking dollar bills with such scrutiny. In the Secret Service files, his case number 880 gave him the nickname Mr. 880 among Secret Service agents. He was identified after his apartment caught fire and he threw his counterfeiting equipment out the window. 
Some children ended up finding some of the counterfeit notes, and agents were able to eventually trace them back to Utner. He was convinc convicted and sentenced to serve one year and one day behind bars, but ended up serving only four months. He was also fined one dollar. After his release, he sold the rights to his story to movie produ producers and actually earned more money from this than from his entire counterfeiting venture. The movie, Mr. A80, was released in 1950, starring Burt Lancaster and Dorothy McGuire, and can be viewed in its entirety for free on YouTube. Counterfeiting may seem like a thing of the past. The United States currency um, may be counterfeiting greater numbers now more than ever, however. And as this coin attests, not just large denomination bills either. This is a genuine 1985 Lincoln cent that a counterfeiter used as a test planchet for their set of counterfeit transfer dies. The dies, however, not being perfectly aligned, allowed for some of the original design to show. On a counterfeit planchet, however, the low denomination and somewhat accuracy of these uh, dies would allow for many to go undetected. This 2004 counterfeit nickel, however, is a bit more easy to distinguish from a genuine coin. The profile of Jefferson is quite wrong, and even the word trust is misspelled on the obverse. The reverse, while a little bit more accurate than the obverse, is still lacking the detail that a genuine coin would have. Nonetheless, who would ever think that they would receive a counterfeit nickel and change in the 21st century? Few, though it can in fact happen. The vast majority of United States money of today are bills, however. By the billions of dollars per year, counterfeiters produce notes of varying degrees of accuracy. The photo from the left is from a website that claims to sell undetectable notes at a fraction of their true value. I would not be surprised if this were actually a federally run website trying to catch those who would try and pass bad notes. The photo on the top right shows how some modern counterfeit bills are produced including a fake watermark and the bottom right photo is from the seizure of a Peruvian counterfeiting ring of more than $60 million in forged United States currency. This concludes my presentation and we will now transfer to the question and answer segment of This Money Talks. I happen to know that there's some true experts in counterfeit money in the audience today, some who will know more than I ever will on this topic. That said, if you feel like you can add any Thing to any of my answers, please do not hesitate to do so. In the spirit of a traditional money talks, I would like this to be more of a conversation than me simply responding to answers. Is Coney slang for counterfeit? Uh, that I couldn't tell you, to be honest with you. Uh, does anyone know that to be true? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yes, 19th century uh, slang. This is Peter. Uh, I think it's 19th century slang. It comes from like the uh, lower, lower levels of society. Interesting. Well, that seems to be the only question we got because apparently people couldn't hear me, but that is okay. Uh, why are German scales more reliable than British scales from Ben Hellings? Hi, Ben. Um, they were uh, better produced. Uh, there were uh, guilds of scale makers in Germany where that wasn't necessarily the case in Britain um, to a, lar a larger degree. And the scales in Britain, um, you know, they were mass produced uh, for export and um, and their quality just, you know, uh, couldn't quite compare and of uh, lower quality um, materials as well. So it wasn't, it wasn't deliberate. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't okay. deliberate. Uh, where can we buy the DVDs of Know Your Money? Um, Amazon. Amazon has them all, uh, all in, uh, you know, in a, in a complete set. You could just buy them all at once. We could hear you, but your voice was extended and then compressed from Burton. Thank you. If one tries to 
pass a Canadian coin in lieu of an American coin, is this considered counterfeit? Uh, Don Squires, um, I don't think so. Uh, does anyone else want to chime in on that? What was the comment? Uh, if someone tries to pass Canadian money instead of American, is this considered counterfeiting? Ask Oliver. <laughs> Oliver, you're muted. A resident Canadian. No. Uh, I've, I've never tried to pass Canadian money down there, but uh, I don't think it would work out. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is Harvey Richard from Vancouver. Um, I've tried this several times and uh, you're not accused of counterfeiting, but they'll often reject it. <laughs> Mary Lannon, isn't it illegal to collect counterfeit money? Um, that is, it is illegal to possess it um, as far as uh, collecting it. Um, that's a, you know, a tricky subject. Uh, if anyone else has any insight on that. Um, I mean, people do openly sell contemporary counterfeits uh, fairly often. I know that on eBay, if you have the word counterfeit in your listing, it'll automatically get, uh, you know, uh, just next. So, um, so there are, you know, it is a, a touchy situation. Um, it, it is a very touchy situation. Um, yeah. You know, the laws actually talk about the intent to defraud, but I actually was in a meeting a couple of years ago with Secret Service, and their attitude right now is that basically they would take any counterfeit coin, arrest the owner, and then let the legal aspect play out to see where it goes from there. Um, Jack Young, where can we get the presentation? Uh, I think I might have to re-record it and it will be on YouTube eventually, uh, probably within, you know, the coming week or so, I would imagine. Uh, we've been able to uh, kind of turn these around rather quickly and get them back onto YouTube. Great. Don Squires, how did the invention of the vending machine uh, using coins affect counterfeiting? Um, that is a good question as well. Uh, I know that whenever a new uh, type of coin or a composition is created by the government, they have to do vending machine tests to see if the coin will um, work properly in vending machines. Um, uh, how it affected counterfeiting. Um, I know that, uh, you know, people have used uh, things that don't even resemble necessarily coins anymore to put into vending machines and they're called slugs and essentially just round pieces of metal because uh, now there's no human interaction. So, um, you know, no one's going to look at it and say, and, you know, be able to necessarily identify it as a counterfeit right away. So as long as it kind of passes through the mechanical aspects of the vending machine, you know, it can enter circulation much more easily. Um, hope that answered your question. If anyone else has any other insight to vending machine usage and technology. Uh, just that I remember years ago, the ability, not that I ever did it, but I, you could on the street buy bags of slugs to mm -hmm. use in parking meters, phone, phone booths when we had it and so on. It was, they were easy to get if you wanted. That's interesting. Are those Humbert slugs or? They were, I'm sorry, say it again? Were they Humbert slugs? For what are Humbert slugs? The, are the Wasp Molitor slugs? No, no, no. They were just blank pieces of uh, steel or some other, or some uh, other cheap alloy. That'd be cool if they were territorials, 50s. You have to go out west for those. <laughs> um, from Burton, uh, or Thai bots, the most common uh, on Reddit is what is this thing? The 10 bot is the same size as a quarter. Uh, are you talking about uh, vending machines, I think, right, Burton? 
No, they're found in circulation constantly. Okay. Because uh, oh, you're two cents or something. Are you referring back to spending counterfeit? I mean, uh, Canadian yeah. coins. Got it. They're they're very common. The other thing is these knockouts from electric boxes. If you file off the little metal tab at the end, is also about the same size. But they don't have an upset rim, so they're technically type ones. <laughs> Do you know if uh, someone was caught using those, would uh, there be any ramif ramifications? I think that would come down to intent. Yeah. Uh, John Thomason, I own a coffee shop and get foreign coins quite regularly. I don't mind. Smiley face. Does the ANS have a specific collection of counterfeits? Yes, we have actually a very large uh, collection of counterfeits, um, ranging from uh, you know the Massachusetts on up to present day, uh, both uh, contemporary counterfeits, um, copies, you know, imitations, um, you know, basically anything that I showed you today, we have some sort of representation of. I would like to add that not everything today actually was from our collection because. Um, you know, we are in this uh, lockdown quarantine and I came to find out that a good portion of our counterfeit coins aren't actually uh, photographed. Uh, so that said, uh, if anyone would like to donate funds for the specific intent of, uh, you know, photographing, uh, funding the photography of these, uh, we would be more than happy to accept it. Uh, wouldn't be the first uh, sort of deal. In fact, our colonial coin genuine pieces, um, the funding for that was uh, by Sid Martin and Roger Saboni, and they funded the entire process of uh, photographing it and are publicly acknowledged as such. Uh, we even just received a donation from an, anon an anonymous uh, individual to uh, better record our um, early uh, modern European uh, collection, which is currently underway right now. So that said, or my little uh, uh, commercial for that, yes, we do have counterfeit coins, but unfortunately all of them are not anywhere near represented on our uh, website. Um, Mary Lannon, I believe ICTA had to ask permission of the Secret Service for display at the ANA convention. Uh, probably. Um, I also know that the ANS, I think in 2010, had a, uh, an exhibition um, curated by uh, Uta Wartenberg um, for counterfeit coins, and I'm pretty sure that she worked pretty closely with the Secret Service throughout the entire process of that. Um, and uh, there's, I came across a, a press release about that uh, while um, preparing for this uh, presentation. Oliver Hoover, where is your scale study published? It is not yet, but I would like it to be in the AJN eventually. Um, it's, you know, pretty much ready to go uh, and was fun to do. And I, That's you know, fun. yeah. Um, probably went through maybe about 40 different scales at the ANS and hundreds of weights and, you know, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, where are the penalties for counterfeiting in the U.S. historically to the, um, to the present or what are the penalties? Uh, well, early on, as pretty famously noted on the back of uh, colonial currency death to counterfeiters, um, from what I understand, I don't know of anyone who was actually put to death under such laws. Um, in the 1876 report that I showed from the Secret Service, um, they also had uh, a list of convictions and the average was about 13 months in prison for the 240 odd people that were convicted. Um, and I don't think it mentioned fines or anything like that, but about 13 months in 1876. Um, I'm not terribly sure of, of the uh, convictions today or the rates or anything like that. Or also if there's a uh, difference between, um, you know, whether I'm sure that there's differences between, uh, you know, 
they are caught in the United States or not in the United States and so on and so forth. About 10 years ago, we had a presentation from a local Washington state detective who basically said that the US attorneys don't take anything but the big cases. They turn the small stuff back to the locals. He did remember when they knocked on the door of some guy's mother to see if she knew about the counterfeit bills and found stacks of 20s around the fireplace. That <laughs> one the USA prosecuted. Funny. Uh, there's a comment, at least one portion of the Know Your Money series appears on to be on YouTube. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are a few of them on there. Um, I wouldn't also be surprised that uh, if there's some missing. So if you want the complete collection, uh, not that I have anything to do with the sale of those, but you know, it'd be interesting to, to see all of them in their entirety. Larry Schwimmer, the Coinage Act of 1857 removed the legal tender status of foreign coinage, though in some cases, two reales were still permitted in some areas. Um, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I actually wrote my dissertation on the circulation of foreign coinage. Um, so, uh, you know, that comment is of particular interest to me. I also know that, uh, like in the Southwest, um, you know, uh, Mexican pesos circulated in, you know, until almost World War One, essentially. Uh, really until the U.S. government had a, a more firm, uh, you know, control of the area monetarily and, and uh, you know, uh, in most cases. Uh, from Burton, uh, technically prevented the government from paying out foreign coinage. Uh, this is back to the Coinage Act of 1857. They were sent to the mint to be assayed, alloyed, and recoined. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, the annual secretary treasury report lists on average value of various foreign coinage and circulation. Uh, the 1857 act required this at least to the 1890s. Uh, I know that there's also reports of, uh, of them melting the coins as well in, in each of the um, treasury acts. Interestingly, also uh, like large cents and stuff like that are also listed in these reports as being melted and then and then reused for to make um, one cent pieces. Uh, Mary Lannon, uh, how many counterfeits? Um, I'm not sure. Mary, do you want to chime in on this one? I just meant how many counterfeits do you think that the ANS owns currently? Oh, just ask uh, the funds. To photograph them and so are you talking thousands or hundreds or probably about a thousand um okay. you know some are right around there uh for the u.s we also have uh, a similar collection maybe even a little bit larger of spanish american um coins uh you know eight reales and below mm -hmm. um and then you know for the rest for the rest of i can only really speak to the western hemisphere um okay. But, uh, but yeah, probably about a thousand US, I would imagine. Interesting. Uh, Joanne Isaac is uh, giving a link. Uh, Funny Money, the fight of the US Secret Service against counterfeit money. That was um, the uh, exhibition hosted by Uta in 2010. Oliver Hoover, the ANS published a book by Phil Mossman a few years back on counterfeit in colonial America. Uh, I also came across a few of his articles uh, from the COAC um, uh, and also uh, some before that from, um, from other ANS events. Uh, I actually wanted to put a, a list of like further reading at the end, but uh, failed to do that. Uh, but there's a really good book called Bad Money by uh, Winston Zach that just came out last year and I think it's going to be a part of a series but I'm pretty sure only the first part was published um, and it's specifically on uh, contemporary copper and uh, the nickel series so the the minor the lower denomination coins but it's really one of the first uh, you know in-depth studies on dye varieties for for like the complete you know run of the series any other questions or comments or anything like that or Nice job, Jesse. Thank you.
We got one from Andy. Has the ANS ever attempted to get the Secret Service to bless the counter or the collecting of contemporary counterfeits? Uh, as far as I know, we have not tried. Um, uh, I think, you know, we kind of had the comment before that one of the main, uh, you know, uh, parts of the counterfeiting laws is the act of deceiving, the intent to deceive. Um, don't ask, don't tell, someone wrote. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I think, uh, yeah, it might kind of go under, you know, um, you know, the, turn a blind eye sort of thing exactly um to counterfeit coinage and the collecting of it in particular you know like um like someone said if you have stacks of uh you know modern 20 dollar bills by your fireplace that's one thing but if you have you know a contemporary counterfeit of a shield nickel that's you know that's something different if there's anything else uh if anyone wants to hello this is bob hey bob how are you doing uh, the collecting of die-struck American counterfeit coins is really quite a popular area of the hobby. Indeed. Considering the uh, old U.S. gold and silver. And I, I've had a couple of interesting experiences relating to our talk today. Uh, when I was at the a, a Museum years ago, uh, we had an occasion when the Secret Service actually confiscated well, they subpoenaed several specimens from the, the large counterfeit collection there to use for their own purposes, and they never returned them. Hmm. So I call it confiscation. So, ah. it's, it's, so the, these things are actually liable to have problems. I also encountered a man who had a job who, which in, required him to visit all of the various vending machines for certain companies in Southern Colorado and there to remove all the oddball coins that had been put into the vending machines in order to try to cheat the, pro uh, the product. Mm. And he told me that he had encountered all kinds of things, mostly slugs of the kind we have mentioned. But among these were pieces he s simply couldn't believe. And he came in to see the, us at the a and on account of one in particular, which appeared to be a pine tree shilling. <laughs> and in fact, when he showed it to me, I, I couldn't see anything wrong with it. It appeared to be a small size pine tree shilling uh, with an extremely even circular planchet and a very flat uh, surface on both sides. And it was exactly the diameter of a quarter, although mm -hmm. not exactly the right weight or, or texture. And uh, this had been cast out by the machine into the group with the slugs and other foreign coins. And this fellow wondered if it could possibly be genuine. And uh, we were able to authenticate it for him. I told him, yes, leave this for authentication. Wow. He was quite pleased. <laughs> That's amazing. Somebody spent a lot of money on a Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine some, probably some father's uh, collection was missing a pine tree shilling when his son got <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, any more comments, questions, or anything like that? Again, I think, how how did my voice come through for the second half? Better? Better, but far from perfect. Okay. About um, the same. Just unmuted you, Dennis. Were you saying something before I saw you talking? Did you have another question? It was entertaining. It was actually quite interesting. It was slow motion and then fast motion. It was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, was it a did better in the Q and A, though. Let's be honest. Come on, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we'll definitely uh, re-record it for the purposes of YouTube. And if you feel like you actually missed anything, uh, hopefully you didn't, but you probably did, uh, you can uh, rewatch it on YouTube in the in the near future. Great job. Very good. Thank you. No. And there's nothing else. I guess that's it for the day. Well, thanks again. Bye, guys. All you rockers, patriots. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.